This module is about cast development. As you know, workers in Queens develop from basically the same eggs. There's no genetic difference in the eggs that are laid. Uh, a worker deter determined egg or a destined egg can be raised in a queen cell and a queen will emerge. The difference is based upon the nutrition. The nutrition determines which of those phenotypes uh, emerged, whether it's a queen or a worker. The bee on the left is a worker honeybee. The bee on the right is a queen. You can see many differences. Their overall shapes are different. Uh, the queen is larger than the worker. The queen's abdomen is shaped differently from the worker. And if you look at the top of the head, the eyes of the queen are separated more than the eyes of the worker. That's because they have differences in their, um, in their vision. Uh, the vision of the worker is much better. But then when you go internally, you find other important differences. Uh, at the top center there are uh, diagrams of the ovaries. The left is an ovary of ovaries of a queen. The right are the ovaries of a worker. The ovaries of the queen contain far more ovarials. Those are those long slender tubules uh, that compo comprise the, the ovary. In fact, there is about 180, 160, 180 ovarials per ovary for a queen. On the right, you can see that there's very few uh, ovarials per ovary for uh, the worker. There, she still has paired ovarials or ovaries. Ovaries are paired, but there's only one or two ovarials usually associated with each ovary. So there's big differences in their reproductive potential. Then to the right of that, you can see the uh, hind legs of a worker. The hind legs of a worker are very different from the hind legs of a queen. The hind legs of the worker contain adaptations. They contain fundamentally varying parts that they can collect and pack pollen. So this is a pollen brush where they can brush the pollen off parts of their body. This is a the uh, pollen press that they use to press the pollen into the corbicula, which is the pollen basket that they then carry on their hind legs. Then below you can see the stingers of queens and workers. The stinger is a modified ovipositor. In many insects, most insects do have an ovipositor through which the females lay eggs. In the honeybee, the ovipositor no longer serves to uh, lay eggs. Uh, it is instead a defensive weapon. On the left, you can see the ovipositor of a worker, and you can see that it's barbed. Uh, this is uh, when it stings mammals like us. Uh, the stinger will embed in the skin, and when the worker tries to pull away, it will stay, remain in the skin, and the worker will pull away and their, her intestines will be left behind. But it's a defensive mechanism that ensures that that stinger, once it lands on a target, will stay. Uh, the stinger on the right is a stinger of a queen. It's smooth, slender, and curved. It's very different. The only time she needs to use that stinger is when she's in mortal combat with other queens, virgin queens, soon after they all emerge in the hive uh, during the process of queen replacement. Her smooth sting allows her to sting again and again. It doesn't rip her in internal organs out and kill her. That would not be uh, a very adaptive trait for a colony to have their queens all die off uh, from their st losing their stingers. On the right here, you see a, a worker honeybee. She's laying an egg. Workers, even though they have very, very small ovaries, still are capable of reproducing. They can lay eggs. And the eggs that they lay uh, give rise to drones, males. Uh, the, the workers are not mated. And unmated female honeybees can, in fact, lay infertile eggs that develop into haploid males. And in another one of the modules, I talk about haplodiploidy and how it occurs. But the worker who lays eggs is really a cheater. It's not in the best interest of her nest mates for her to be laying eggs. What's in their best interest reproductively is if they lay the eggs, 
uh, and and by the, the they're the only one who lays eggs, and then the queen lays all the rest. But that's really hard to achieve. So the fact that the workers can lay eggs sets up an egg laying competition. Uh, any egg layers in competition with the other bees in the nest who don't who are not served well by her laying the eggs. It's not in their reproductive interests and also in competition with the queen. The competition to be an egg layer actually starts early. It starts when they're larvae in their cells. Uh, larvae secrete pheromones. These are chemicals that are produced by the larvae. They're secreted to the surface of, the, of their body. And those pheromones alter the behavior of other bees around them, especially nurse bees. <clears throat> nurse bees respond to the brood pheromones by feeding the larvae. So you could call it a feed me pheromone. So you can imagine that larvae in their cells are screaming out with these chemical messages saying, feed me, feed me. And the nurses are walking around and they're sticking their heads in the cells. And the ones that may be screaming the loudest might get fed the most. And bees that get fed more, workers that get fed more, have larger ovaries and more ovarials when they emerge. There's a direct relationship between what they eat and the status of their ovaries. Those that have more ovarials, those who perhaps have eaten more as larvae, uh, have ovaries that are more developed uh, early in life. So in this particular case, the ovaries on the right, you can see that they're kind of opaque and there's more ovarial filaments. The one on the left is uh, more transparent or translucent uh, and it's at a lower state of activity. When conditions are such that workers can lay eggs, when, when the conditions are right for that, the individuals who have more developed ovaries are more likely to become the laying workers. So the competition for workers that lay eggs begins in the larval stage when they're competing for food from the nurses. So as a consequence um, of this competition, if you go back millions of years, perhaps there was a system that was a little bit different with respect to producing queens and workers. You can imagine that at one time, before there were the two very distinct castes, the worker caste and the queen caste, the degree of queenness may not have been so absolute. They didn't, maybe they didn't have such a distinct worker caste as they have today. And there might have been competition among different larvae about getting more food to maybe emerging and being very queen-like or being a queen even. So the competition may have been at that stage. But the workers in the nest, they didn't need to have a whole lot of competition. It was not, it was not in the, in the, the, to the best uh, advantage of the colony to have the competition. So they developed a program for feeding the larvae whereby the workers ended up being forced into this other phenotype. They were forced away from the queen phenotype into the worker phenotype by the way that they were fed. So for instance, this shows a, a feeding program to produce a queen or a worker. The queen's program was probably the, was probably the, the ancestral one. You, you make a cell, you lay an egg in it, um, then the nurses feed it as much as they can, ad lib, cap it, and then what comes out, uh, you know, there could be variation in how much food got in there. So you had some individuals that were more queen-like and some that were less queen-like uh, as, as sort of a, of a random chance. Um, but over time, the nurse bees evolved to have a restricted diet for those individuals that were gonna become workers. So if you look at a queen, th these are the larval instar stages. Uh, they're roughly a day each. Uh, and between these stages, the larvae molt. They lose their skin, they shed it, and then build a new one. Um, in the first three larval instars, queens are fed, larvae that are destined to become queens, are fed sh uh, food, um, royal jelly, ad lib, uh, with a high sugar concentration. 
mean, ad lib mean they get all that they possibly want. In fact, they're fed in surplus. There's surplus food in their cells during this period of time. Um, the workers get fed basically the same diet. The queen, queen jelly is, or royal jelly is, you know, the same as is fed to the workers and to the, and to the queens. The difference is the sugar content. So the worker diet had, again, ad lib feeding more than they can eat, but has low sugar. So they're getting less carbohydrate in their diet initially. In the third to through fourth larval instars, the uh, queen is getting, again, ad lib feeding, all she can eat and more, uh, and it stays with a high sugar content. Whereas the worker diet changes in that uh, it's still low sugar, but they restrict it. Now they're feeding them, you know, just intermittently from, from mouth to mouth. And the larvae are not getting all that they want. And they, they're crying out with their pheromones saying, feed me, feed me. But they're getting a restricted diet compared to what the queens get. In the fifth larval instar, the queen continues to get high sugar and fed ad lib. But the worker larvae, the larvae that are destined to become workers, they now get a higher sugar concentration than they had before. But they still get a restricted food diet. They're still not getting all that they want, but the sugar content goes up. The increase in the sugar content is necessary to stimulate the hormones that result in this final molt from, from a fifth larval instar into a prepupa. Uh, if you, they don't get the higher sugar, they die. They have to have it in order to make that molt. Then as a prepupa, the queen still gets high sugar and they'll fill her cell up completely full to the brim with royal jelly and then they will cap it. So then for the next day and a half, two days, she continues to eat inside of that cell and she still has all the food she can possibly eat. Whereas the workers, they get their cell capped with no food under underneath and they go another two two and a half days uh starving they have less food than they than they want and they starve those last those last uh, couple of days of development and so this kind of control of the nutritional program the feeding program in the end distinguishes between the queen phenotype and the worker phenotype and we know this because we can do in vitro rearing and, and test what different kinds of feeding regimes have on, on the, um, uh, the larvae that we produce. The, here I have four Petri dishes. Um, the top two, you can see the royal jelly. You can purchase royal jelly from commercial royal jelly producers. They steal it away from the bees and then they freeze it. And you can buy, and you can raise bees on that food. That food's perfectly good. And you can raise queens on it, and you can raise workers on it. Uh, but in our case, we tried all different kinds of feeding regimes. Uh, we fed them in mass, like we show here, where we just put a whole lot of larvae on a, on a drop. We let them eat it, and then they were in competition with each other uh, for the food. Uh, we also fed them individually, not shown here, and we tried to mimic a queen diet while we fed them, getting, giving them food ad lib. Uh, and we used high, high sugar concentrations, low sugar concentrations. We varied the protein content of the, of the, the food that we gave them. And you know, we could raise these, these larvae all the way up to be adults. In this case, we're showing uh, worker adults. When we did this, when we looked at the workers and queens or the, the adults that emerged, we plotted them on a pl this plot. If you look at it, uh, on the left are the number of ovarials in the individuals that we produced. And across the bottom is their body mass. Body mass and ovarial number are the two main distinguishers of how queen-like you are. Queens are about double the size and weight of a worker. And of course they have more ovarials. And there's a relationship between the body mass and the number of ovarials. As body mass goes up, number of ovarials goes up. And that's even within uh, the workers themselves. If you looked at the workers alone, they would show that trend. 
This cloud shows all the difference. We, we had thousands of them that we, that we raised. And this shows all the different uh, individuals or body mass in ovaries. You can see that it's a big cloud of traits. Then we had workers, nurse bees in colonies raise workers and worker bees in colonies raise queens. We then looked at the queens and took all of the different measurements of all the different queens, ovarials and body mass, and we, plot, we plotted them out and they were all contained in this box. They were all inside that box. When we did the same with the workers, and we looked at them, the, when the workers raised the workers, they're all contained in that box. So they're, they're restricting them in ways that give us these two distinct kinds of phenotypes. They did not get these ones in the middle that we get. This shows us that there's something more than the food going on. It's, there's, there's a food delivery system and a program that's important for to get the two distinct kinds of phenotypes. It's not just simply, you know, one gets more food and gets big and the other gets less food and gets small. It's, it's controlled much more than that. It showed you in that program, the feeding program right there. That's what they came up with over evolutionary times to produce those two distinct phenotypes. The developmental program is shared. You know, we think about the larva. The larva is running a developmental program, a genetic program, that takes it through these different stages of development, through these different larval instars. And they, they go through these and they end up being a worker. Or they go through these and they end up being a queen. They're getting fed. The larvae are not, are, are also involved in this program and the decision making of the program. Okay, the workers are feeding the larvae, the larvae are taking the food in. But the program overall, what ends up in the end, is shared by the two. We had two strains of bees. We call them the high strain and the low strain. We, we, we raised them over 30 generations for uh, palm, the, the amount of pollen they store in the comb. But these two populations of bees have been separate for 30 years and 42 generations. We then took larvae from the low strain and we grafted them into a, into a colony, and the nurse bees were the low strain. So this, so you have low strain nurse bees feeding low strain larvae here, and then we ended up with bees that had uh, workers that had ovaries like this. So this would be the worker ovary of uh, workers that were raised, you know, like low strain workers raised by low strain nurses. Then the same with the high strain. So high-strain larvae were raised by high-strain nurses. And this is the, uh, the size of the ovary that we ended up with. So the low-strain bees, the combination of the larvae and the nurses, ended up with adult workers that had larger ovaries than the uh, low-strain bees. Then we cross-fostered them. We took larvae from the low-strain and we had them raised by nurses from the high strain. And then larvae from the high strain raised by nurses of the low strain. When we cross fostered them, we got something interesting that we didn't expect. High strain larvae raised by low strain nurses were even bigger than high strain larvae raised by high strain nurses. And when we looked at low strain larvae raised by low strain nurses as opposed to low strain larvae raised by high strain nurses, they, they ended up with ovaries a little bit smaller if they, if they were raised by the high strain than they did if they were raised by the low strain. So what does this show? This shows that there's a nutrition dependent developmental mechanism involved in this development. The larvae are responding to what's being fed, and not all of them are doing the same thing. High strain larvae are responding to what they're being fed differently from the low strain larvae being what they're fed. Because the nurse behavior, feeding behavior, and the larval development, they evolve together in our breeding program 
to, 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 to match each other to produce the appropriate phenotype of worker. The same went on in the low strain. They evolved together the proper response, developmental response from the larva and the food response of the nurses. Uh, they, they evolved to produce the appropriate sized uh, and, and developmentally stated or staged individuals for the low strain. So this clearly shows that the developmental program of a bee, queen bee or a nurse bee or a worker bee, is shared between the development of the larva itself and the feeding behavior of the nurse bees.